In June 1977, two young women set off on a journey of self-discovery. They were 19-year-old Terry Gents and her roommate, 20-year-old Avra Goldman, both of whom were enrolled at Yale University at the time. They were off for their summer break. They were just at the start of their lives and the Trans America Trail had just opened up. So they decided to take their bikes and travel along the trail, seeing what the countryside had to offer and what they would find along the way. Before delving into today's case, we would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Established Titles. Through established titles, you can purchase souvenir plots of land in the gorgeous Scottish countryside, a place our channel calls home. Scottish Customs allows you to become a lord or lady, or as us Scots call it, a laird, upon the purchase of a plot of land. Purchasing these plots of land makes a fun gift for family and friends, not to mention is a must-have for any avid fans of Scotland itself. The purchase of these plots also helps preserve the natural Scottish woodlands, as well as help support reforestation efforts across the globe. It's a truly feel-good gift in which you can become a lord or lady and you can help the environment. Each dedicated plot located on a private estate in Edelston is at least one square foot and has a unique plot number waiting just for you. This and an official crested certificate is given to you upon your purchase, making your new title of Lord or Lady official. You can even use it on the likes of your credit cards. Established titles promise to plant a tree with every order across the world, working alongside One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future charities, which aims to support reforestation projects. What could be a more perfect, last-minute and thoughtful gift for someone you love? For viewers of this channel, Established Titles is offering the first 200 people to purchase a title pack using our link below will be right next to our plot. Established Titles are currently running a huge Black Friday sale right now, plus you can use the code DARKCURIOSITIES at checkout to get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash dark curiosities to purchase your plots as gifts now and help support our channel and reforestation. Thank you so much once again to Established Titles for sponsoring today's video. Terry Gents later said, quote, I really had no clue what America was about, but what I do remember is what you hear in the rock songs of those times. You know, like the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac, go your own way. It was a sense that anything was possible, and you just go out and make it happen. That's what Terry and Avra wanted to do, and that's exactly what they did when they set off on their bicycles, making it from New Haven, Connecticut to Astoria, Oregon, where the trail ended for them. Terry and Avra had enjoyed the difficult but life-changing journey across to Oregon, and for their final night camping on the trail, they pulled into Klein Falls State Park and set up their tent. It was early evening, but the park was still pretty full of other people outside enjoying the countryside. There were young couples, either walking or driving around, and teenagers out drinking and doing other things teenagers do in the parks when it gets dark. But when night fell, the only campers around were Terry and Avra. They weren't put off by this. They'd made it all the way to Oregon by camping in places just like this, so they knew what to expect, and they were pretty used to sleeping outside by this point. But Terry and Avra felt a little uneasy about something. They couldn't figure out what it was, what was different about this park, and they didn't want to come across as being paranoid. But eventually they broke down and talked about it between themselves. Terry described it as, quote, an eerie feeling, like they were being watched, but the girls eventually came to the conclusion that they were just being a bit sensitive and were probably a little spooked from going to having a full park of people around them to suddenly being on their own. So they closed the tent and went to sleep. 
But at around 11.30 p.m. that night, Terry woke up to a horrible sound and to a terrible pain all through her body. She was still inside the tent, what was left of it anyway, but she couldn't move. She could barely breathe because her chest was under the wheel of a pickup truck. She tried to make sense of what was happening and she tried to get out from underneath it. She thought that there was a possibility that this had all been an accident and that some of the teenagers who'd been out in the park earlier that evening had been drinking and swerved off the road into their tent. This thought actually calmed her down for a second. She thought that in just a minute she'd hear a lot of noise as they all climbed out of the truck and ran to help. But only one person got out of the truck and Terry quickly realised that whoever it was had no intentions of helping them. Terry saw a man dressed in what she described as cowboy clothes, saying he looked sleek and well-dressed, but that was about all she could see of him before she heard Avra screaming at him to leave them alone. Terry heard Avra shout one more time and she could just about crane her neck to see the man lift his hatchet up in the air and hit Avra across the head with it. Terry knew by this point they were in serious trouble. Then she struggled to get out from under the wheel of the truck, but she was completely trapped. One of her arms didn't move at all, and she could just about move the other, so she couldn't do anything when she heard Avra being hit with the hatchet another six times. Dazed, confused and terrified, Terry heard the man walk back over to her, and she knew he was going to kill her too, so she begged him to leave them alone. She told him to take whatever he wanted, but just to go, begging him one more time to leave them be, but he lifted his hatchet again and brought it down. Terry wasn't sure how she did it, but she just acted on instinct and managed to catch the hatchet by the blade and stop it from hitting her chest, ignoring it cutting into her hand and begging him to leave them alone once again. And for whatever reason, the man stood up and climbed back into his truck. He drove away, crushing Terry once again, and she was left even more dazed and disorientated for a moment before she remembered what had happened. She pulled herself up and out of what was left of her sleeping bag and the tent, and she stumbled over to Avra, who was lying half covered by her sleeping bag several feet away from where they'd pitched their tent. Avra wasn't moving, and when Terry checked the wound on the back of her head, she felt the hole where her skull had been caved in by the hatchet, and she knew her friend was sadly dying. Terry knew she had to get help, so she managed to make her way back to their bicycles, and her only thought was riding to the nearby town and finding someone to come and help Avra, but she couldn't lift her arms. Terry fumbled with the locks on her bike for a little longer before she realised that even if she managed to get the locks open, she wouldn't be able to ride it. So she tried to think of something else to do, and then she saw headlights on the road. She hoped that it was someone she could ask for help, but she also knew that there was a distinct possibility that it was the man coming back to finish the job, and she had a choice to make. Deciding it was better to just risk it, she threw herself towards the road and managed to signal the driver that she needed help and the car stopped. It was actually a young teenage couple named Bill Penhollow and Darlene Gervais and they were understandably terrified to see a blood-soaked Terry stumbling towards them but they pulled it together and followed her back to the campsite where they found Avra still lying on the ground. Bill and Darlene struggled to get her in the back of their car, and then they all froze, seeing another set of headlights coming towards them, 
and knowing it was probably the man who'd done this to Terry and Avra, and not knowing what to do about it. But the lights stopped, and then they turned around and drove away, and Bill and Darlene finished packing Terry and Avra in the back seat of their car, and they took off towards the hospital. Avra was immediately put into an emergency brain surgery that lasted for nine and a half hours, and both of Terry's arms were broken. She had a broken leg, her collarbone, and several of her ribs were also broken, and her lungs had been crushed. Bill and Darlene later described that when she'd stumbled out towards their car that night, she'd been covered in so much blood that it was dripping off the ends of her hair. Both Terry and Avra miraculously survived the attack, but Avra was left with permanent damage to her sight and couldn't remember anything about that night, and Terry hadn't gotten a good sight of who'd attacked them. Investigators were on the scene a little over midnight, but they couldn't find very much to work with. They had the tyre tracks, but even they weren't really much of a clue. Only one of the tyres had actually had any tread on it. The two back ones looked like they had been worn down until there was no pattern left, and investigators believed that that could have also been the case with the other front tyre but it hadn't made enough of a clear impression at the campsite to determine that for sure. And that was about all they had. The attacker left no other physical evidence at the scene, and neither of the women could remember what he'd looked like, aside from Terry saying that he'd been dressed like a cowboy. But within weeks, rumours around the community had spread about the hatchet man, and they all thought that they knew who he was. Members of the community pointed the finger at 17-year-old Dick Dam, and the police brought him in for questioning. He claimed to know nothing about the attack, and they had no physical evidence to tie him to it, not even the tyre tracks because he had just had new tyres put on his own truck, and they couldn't track down the old ones. Investigators brought him in multiple times for questioning, but he never gave them anything to work with and never gave them an alibi for where he'd been at the time of the attacks. But investigators did find out something about him. Close to the date of the attack, Dick Dam had gotten into a physical fight with his girlfriend, Janie Farley. The fight had actually been so bad that Janie's father pressed charges against him and the couple went to court where it came out that Dick had been physically and emotionally abusive towards Janie for their entire relationship. But the judge advised Janie's father to drop the charges against Dick because both parties were still minors. Janie's father agreed and Dick was let go and faced no consequences for his abuse towards Janie. But Janie didn't take this lying down. She'd actually been the one who'd spoken to investigators about how Dam could have been the hatchet man and that she knew that the toolbox he kept his hatchet in in the back of his truck was gone. Investigators and the community believed her, the community going as far as to call him Dick Dam the Hatchet Man from then on out, but there was still no physical evidence to tie him to the scene, and Terry or Avra still couldn't remember what their attacker's face looked like. Dam has been in and out of prison for a multitude of unrelated charges since, but one time when he was out, investigators brought him in for two polygraph tests. The first result was inconclusive. The second one said that Dick showed signs of deception, but that was later explained when it came to light that he was high on meth during the test. And another time, Terry went into a diner that he was in, so she could see what he looked like. She didn't confront him and she still couldn't remember his face, but she said that she knew it was him from the way he carried himself and the way that he dressed. But by then, the statute of limitations had passed on the crimes, meaning that investigators couldn't charge him for the assault, even if they wanted to. 
and Terry has worked hard on getting changes made to legislation for the statute of limitations ever since. Thank you.